There's not one size fits all that we're great on sustainability and digital, therefore you should open a company. It doesn't usually work like that. There's usually a couple of other factors which are at play and it depends on the company. For example, if you're a data center, we can guarantee 100% renewable energy for your data center. We now have 140 new Nordic tech startups looking specifically for Japanese investors and partners. The verticals that are getting the most attention are within smart city urban tech, health tech, and also food tech. We did do a lot of work with fintech as well. You have just heard from Oliver Hall, the head of tech investments for Europe and Japan at Copenhagen Capacity, and a co-founder and investment director for Japanese investments at the Nordic Asian Venture Alliance. We have quite some ground to cover in the areas of sustainability, digitalization, foreign direct investment, Japanese capital, and the new Nordics. So let us dive right in. Today I'm very happy to finally have a conversation with Oliver Hall. Good evening, Oliver. Good afternoon, Norbert. So good evening in Japan and uh, good afternoon in Copenhagen. Thank you very much for having me. I think we had this in the hopper for a long time. So it's <laughs> fantastic to ultimately have this chat. We titled this Japanese capital and foreign direct investment into the new Nordics. There's so much to unpack in there. Shall we define what the new Nordics are to start with? The new Nordics is the region that includes the Nordics and the Baltics. Funnily enough, it's a description that was actually created by an Estonian, which is a Baltic country. So the Nordics, we say Denmark, Sweden, Norway, which is Scandinavia, plus Finland, also Greenland and Iceland. Those are the Nordics and the Baltics are Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Collectively, we call them the, the new Nordics. They are the most digitized countries on the planet, according to every single international ranking. And mostly the Nordics are the most progressive in terms of carbon neutrality, sustainability, impact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Collectively, the region is quite a formidable area, and it's also getting a lot of attention from Japan. Now about you, what is the path that led you to the Nordics? So I'm actually British. I was born and raised in England and studied European languages. After I worked in the Department of Trade and Industry in Westminster in London, I ended up moving to Japan in 2003. So I've just celebrated 20 years of my first outing there. I lived in Japan for three and a half, four years, I worked and lived in Kansai, mostly around Osaka, Kyoto and Kobe. My family is also from Kobe. I have a, a home there as well. I'm there usually about two or three months of every year. I moved back to London with my wife, where we stayed for three and a half years. Professionally, I was working within FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, supporting foreign companies to establish operations in another location. For a French management consultancy, we worked for 30, 35 different of these investment promotion agencies, which were fighting to get foreign companies to set up in their city. By far the best client we had, who had also won some awards from the World Bank, the United Nations at that time, was an agency called Copenhagen Capacity, the inward investment agency for Copenhagen. A week before my wedding, I was very lucky. The CEO offered a job here and for my wife and I to relocate to Copenhagen and coming up for almost 13 years. Still loving the job, loving the city. That's the personal life in a nutshell. That's the Copenhagen connection. But on a Nordic scale, we do a lot of work. We have a very close collaboration with a lot of the startup ecosystems, the investor ecosystems, the cities, etc., in helping to attract Japanese investment to the region, capital investment and FDI, but also helping new Nordic tech startups to get into Japan as well. So that's the Japanese, the Copenhagen and the Nordic angle. We got married in Japan in Kobe in the July. We came over to see Copenhagen, my wife, for the first time to see Copenhagen in September when the weather was beautiful. We moved over in the middle of October where it was just gray, cloudy, rainy for the next six or seven months. Yeah, not the best of honeymoons, <laughs> but we're still here. My hometown is Hamburg, so the weather is yes. uh, very similar in that triangle london <laughs> copenhagen uh, hamburg so our first trip was during christmas season when it's really gray and slushy and they set the expectation low from the beginning 
But Hamburg is a beautiful city. I haven't seen it in the winter. I've seen it in the summer and it's beautiful. But during November and December, we have a lot of the Christmas markets. Some actually come up from Germany to Copenhagen. So it, it is cold and dreary, but there's something which is cozy. The Danish concept of sugar, H-Y-G-E, the concept of warmth and, and coziness at home. For anyone who's listening, you're welcome to come to Copenhagen and Hamburg, either in the summertime or in the wintertime. Both are beautiful. I also feel personally a bit excluded within New Nordic simply because the Baltic region has been very thriving since 16th, 17th century, right? The Hanse was always a, a big union of everything around the Baltic mm. Sea. And so mm. I feel like Hamburg should be part of the New Nordics. I think at one point Hamburg might, oh, I'm not sure, because the, the Danish-German border uh, has changed a lot over the, uh, the centuries. So um, maybe in the future, you never know. Yeah. All right, enough banter. You threw out at the beginning already some of the keywords, digital, carbon neutrality, sustainable development goals, which uh, the Nordics are excelling at and of huge interest from Japan, is that where most of the time is spent, most of the money is spent, or what are additional themes? In terms of investments and knowledge exchange, it's fairly evenly spread, but sustainability and the environment is a big part of it historically, and most recently digital as well. Estonia has done a marvelous job in developing and also in, in getting Japan's attention. And I think Japan still puts a lot more focus on Estonia on the digital side. On the sustainability and environmental side, Denmark was the world's first country to create an environmental protection law. Back in the 70s, it, it was the world's first country to create offshore and onshore wind technologies as well. It's been non-nuclear since 1985. There's a long history of developing technologies and changing laws. After the Fukushima disaster in March 2011, the first overseas trip the governor of Fukushima made was to Copenhagen. He came to visit us here where we showed him how to create large-scale, sustainable, clean energy infrastructures, because Fukushima didn't have one. We stopped a wind turbine and had him and his delegation come in and see how the technology worked, how you can create the consortia and the financial platforms to enable and build these large infrastructure projects. And we've had so many delegations from Kyushu all the way up to Sapporo who are learning about everything from wind technology, but also in English, we call it CHP technologies. Chinetsu Denbo in Japanese, it's district heating, where you burn energy or waste, and then you pump the heat across the city to warm up the city. There's lots of different technologies that have had focus. That's in terms of the knowledge exchange, in terms of the investments. This morning, I had a senior delegation from the, uh, the Japanese headquarters, Notemachi, of one of the, the general trading companies, which has just invested into a world-first energy production facility in Western Denmark. It's previously invested into a, a similar facility in another Scandinavian country about four months ago. We're seeing a, a lot of interest in these investments. We've had Hitachi open up their first European big data center here. A lot of that was based around the Copenhagen strategy to become the world's first carbon neutral capital city. So sustainability plays a big role in this. If you look at the SDG rankings, you'll see Denmark, Finland and Sweden generally in the top four. And then if you round out the top 10, it's generally two more Nordic countries and Estonia who usually feature in the global top 10 out of 200 in terms of SDG progression and compliance. And that's a, a very strong sales point for Japanese companies who want to invest in the region. Copenhagen aiming to become the first carbon neutral city is yeah. an interesting point. Can you share a bit more as to one, the timeline and second, the measures that have been taken to accomplish that? Actually, it's going to miss the self-imposed deadline. It was supposed to be by 2025, but we had a bit of a budget setback with COVID. Denmark was Europe's first country to, to close and also to reopen during COVID. The economy took a, a hit, so the budgets and the strategies have been moved back a little bit. In 2011, we had what we call a cloud burst, which is a record amount of rain in a very short period of time, which overwhelmed a lot of the city's water infrastructure. And we had flooding in the city, which caused damage to, for example, local hospitals who had their servers in the basements. There were billions in insurance claims. 
after that. The city realized this is man-made and it needs a man-made solution. It brought together the triple helix of the public sector, private sector, and academia, working together to identify what the structural problems were in the city and what solutions needed to be built. So it created something called the Copenhagen 2025, which was the city's strategy to becoming carbon neutral by 2025. There were four main pillars around mobility, energy production. The city was, up until that point, was producing about 1.8 million tonnes of, of CO2 per year. It needed to, to bring that down completely to zero. Energy production was mostly taken care of through wind turbines and district heating. Energy efficiency was retrofitting a lot of old buildings and making them more efficient. Mobility was, for example, reducing the number of cars on the streets. Ten years ago, about 35% of Copenhageners were cycling to work, and now the, the figure is closer to 75%. So of all citizens are, are cycling to work, to school, to kindergarten or, or wherever. So that was another part of the, the mobility side. And the fourth was public buildings. It was retrofitting a lot of the public buildings. The target was very close to being hit by 2025, but it's been pushed back slightly. <laughs> but Helsinki, Helsinki in Finland have very aggressive targets. Sweden has very aggressive targets. Norway is already well ahead because it is already heavily electrified. I'm not sure about this. Estonia's environmental strategy, but if they're anywhere near as good as their digital strategy, then they're exceptionally close. Even if the target gets missed a little bit, that's still a tremendous amount of action. And I think it's good to have some countries as a first mover. People look at Estonia in developing its digital infrastructure that can defend itself perfectly well against outside attacks that can completely service its own population, public services, attracting foreign e-residents or foreign businesses. And you can look at these outliers and first movers, and it gives inspiration to other countries. So we're lucky to be living in a country that has always had the environment at its heart. Japan is like 15 times the size of Denmark. So it's a lot easier to be able to say this Nordic country, this Baltic country is better when your population is one and a half million or eight million, as opposed to 127 million. So there we go. And in the same way that the geography or the terrain is maybe not that great for mm. nuclear reactors, it's also equally bad to have big wind turbines on shaking ground. I've heard this from a few different companies that most of the wind in Japan, I think, is around Kita Kyushu and up in Hokkaido, as much in other parts. If you look at near my second hometown of Kobe, there's a lot of onshore turbines in Iwaji Island, the other side of the Akashi Bridge, and I don't usually see the turbines going around. What they tried to do in Fukushima, there was a project called Fukushima Forward because of the threat of tsunami and earthquakes. What they did was they had floating turbines fixed to the seabed with steel ropes. So they were floating. If there was an earthquake, they would hopefully be able to stay up. And because they were floating, you could also generate energy from the waves at the same time. The one thing we see with Japan is that the weaknesses that it might have, there's also some massive strengths that it does have. One thing that Japan does thankfully have is a huge amount of money to invest and bring that technology back. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries did a joint venture with a Danish company called Vestas, which is the world's largest producer of wind turbines. They opened up an R&D center in West Denmark, and they developed the world's longest wind turbine, which has been commercialized. Three days ago, Vestas broke a world record for the most power created by a single wind turbine. It's 80 meters tall. It smashed the world record for production. If that was due to Japanese capital, then it's something that can be brought back to Japan to be commercialized. So, yeah, the geography plays against Japan, but they have a lot of capacity to develop technologies and to commercialize them. Yeah. I want to come back to the Estonian digital example Simply because there was some interest in Japan to look at the digital citizenship infrastructure mm. and possibly yeah. import it. Right? We mm. had a business development team from Estonia here on yeah. site, which was like half a dozen yeah. people. After all, unfortunately, this didn't go 
anywhere and we're still no. struggling at this point getting my yeah, number yeah. cards out right ultimately i don't want to pick on the bad examples so much especially if no. you have good ones talk about like the mitsubishi heavy industry mm. but the number of delegations coming to copenhagen and looking around doesn't yeah. matter as much as the real investments of the export of mm. technology from the north to mm. actually implement in japan We actually had the cabinet office from Japan coming over to study the Danish mine number. It was either Denmark or Sweden, I still can't work out which, which created the world's first citizens register. Denmark was 1962. So everyone was assigned a number. And then every person who lives in Denmark is assigned one of these numbers. And everything's connected there from your health records to your entry into the swimming pool to your mortgage. And we had a delegation from the cabinet office. But I think there's a difference between the political will and the, the commercial ability to implement a big project like this. We see this with a lot of Japanese projects where it's generally the, the same companies doing the same projects. And sometimes you need to shake it up with a bit of outside inspiration and, and expertise. I think it's good that the digital agency has come in. It's part of their responsibility to help with the procurement of solutions. In Japan, diff different here and, and in Estonia as well, you can have Hitachi giving a system to one ministry, Fujitsu giving another system to another ministry, another solutions provider giving something to another municipality, and there's no ability to connect. There's no integration, no vertical integration. The platforms in Denmark and Estonia use the same underlying infrastructure to connect the doctors with the hospitals managed by municipalities and the hospitals are managed by the region, but also with the tax authorities, which is a national agency. So you can go across and up and down as well. Everything is able to be aligned. And there haven't been any major collapses. But in Japan, it's different because you have companies doing the same thing, but they don't generally have the outside expertise. Which brings me on to the second example. NEC from Japan bought Denmark's largest tech company about three years ago, three and a half years ago, called KMD. And it was this company that still has most of the public sector contracts in Denmark. There was an announcement that NEC invested in the KMD, and now KMD is offering some private set platforms in Japan to help with digitization for procurement or invoicing. Many know that Japan still has the stamp or the hunko, which is widely used, but this is a step to get into the 21st century. It's one of the hottest topics in the fintech sector, the digital invoicing, because we get what looks very similar to the European VAT number system. There's been lots of work going on towards that and naturally then push towards stampless invoicing yeah. and so yeah. forth. Yeah. I can give an example there. My wife is from Japan. When we first moved to Denmark, she registered her company online. She didn't have to go to a bank or an office. Everything was done online. Even her accounting, her tax, her yearly taxation report, everything. I think she was running a Japanese business, but she'd be doing it from a laptop in London or in Kobe or wherever we were in the world. My mother-in-law still has a local business in Kobe and just the amount of paperwork and having to go to the Kriakusho, the ward office and back and forth. There's room for improvement, I think. NEC. It's a good example in terms of buying a company in, in Denmark. Maybe two years ago, they bought Everlock in Switzerland, which is one of the largest wealth management software companies. Yes. You see them, for example, the Singapore Fintech Festival was an NEC stand mm -hmm. that was essentially peddling the yeah. Everlock software. And it's good that they use the cash that they have to make this type of acquisition. And maybe that yeah. avoids the development time that is otherwise required. Last time I was at the Singapore FinTech Festival for a delegation with NRI, the Nomura Research mm. Institute, they actually opened up their European data center in Copenhagen two years ago. There was a sustainability and a digital reason why they chose Copenhagen. So yeah, there are a lot of the big guys, but surprisingly, there's some insanely cool startups and scale-ups from Japan who are, who are also looking at the Nordics. We have an IoT company from Tokyo. We have some scale-ups working within Quantum from Japan who are looking at the region. It's not just the big boys that are looking at this area. It's a lot of the smaller companies, the higher end of the smaller companies, I should say. What is the competitive advantage that Copenhagen offers for this type of company, for this kind of startup that is more on the deep tech side? 
It really depends on the company. And there's a lot of similarities between Copenhagen, Helsinki, Tallinn, Stockholm, Oslo. And with each company that's opening here, each foreign company that's opening here, there's usually a special reason that's particular to their business. There's not one size fits all that we're great on sustainability and digital, therefore you should open a company. It doesn't usually work like that. There's usually a couple of other factors which are at play and it depends on the company. For example, if you're a data center, we can guarantee 100% renewable energy for your data center. We can give you reduced rates of electricity. Some companies, like Apple, Facebook, Amazon, have done deals with the municipalities where they get lower rates of electricity and clean energy to power their data centers in exchange for the excess heat, which is generated by the data center. And data centers have a lot of heat. All of the excess heat is then pumped back into the district heating infrastructure. The excess heat can then warm up 5,000 houses, for example. Mm. If you're a quantum company, Copenhagen's the birthplace of Niels Bohr, which you'll see in the new Oppenheimer movie, but he's the grandfather of quantum mechanics. I could go on, but there's not one size fits all. The reasons are generally around the digital capabilities, the sustainable policies, but maybe more importantly than that, it's actually the work-life balance that we have in these regions. We, unlike Japan, we don't work until 8 p.m. I'm leaving the office at 3.30, maybe 4 o'clock to go and pick the kids up. And that's very common over here. We're world leading on gender equality. Many of the countries in the region, Denmark's a little bit behind. But in terms of being a mother, a company founder, an entrepreneur, there's a lot of reasons why you'd, you'd, you'd want to be here. Yeah. So maybe startups from the Nordics that are hot or are as part of current cohorts you're building with neighbor mm. as well to come over and, yeah. and do a tour? Copenhagen Capacity is a founding member of a project called NAVA. NAVA. It's the Nordic Asian Venture Alliance. Since 2017, there's been this flood of Japanese venture capital into the region's startups, our tech startups, but also into the local VC funds as well. It's based in Copenhagen, but it's very much a new Nordic integrated collaborative project that has the region's investment promotion agencies, the trade councils, the startup clusters, the investor ecosystems, all collaborating together to welcome more Japanese venture capital um, and investors and startups into the region, but also to have a united front to send our startups and scale-ups to Japan. The project is currently sponsored by the Danish Industrial Foundation, so it's mostly free of charge. And we have about 30 different partners involved. Everyone from Take Barbecue, which is the largest Scandinavian startup and investor event, to regional investment promotion agencies in Estonia, like Startup Tart, to other agencies like Helsinki and Partners. Yes. And we regularly send startup delegations to Japan from all of the new Nordic countries. We also have VC delegate, venture capital delegations visiting Japan. And we also welcome a lot of delegations over here as well. We're welcoming about 50, 60 Japanese to take barbecue in September. That was the introduction to Nava. So the question... Some of the examples, either this, the sectors or the actual startups that are part of the mm -hmm. cohorts that are being planned for Japan visits at the moment. If anyone wants to look at the cohorts that we have, then you can look at the platform. It's nordicasian.vc or you can just look for NAVA. We now have 140 new Nordic tech startups looking specifically for Japanese investors and partners. We've said no to 300 companies who wanted to be on the platform because the product or the team or the funding wasn't ready. The verticals that are getting the most attention are within smart city urban tech, health tech, and also food tech. We did do a lot of work with fintech as well. And there are a few examples of fintech unicorns in Denmark alone, like uh, last year or the year before that. Mitsubishi actually invested into Chainalysis. We have Playo and Lunaway and others like that. We had a delegation of 14 startups visiting Smart City Tokyo in February this year. They finished up. You can see all of the details online at the website. On the final day, there was a, a tour with Kajima, one of the top three construction companies in Japan. And some of the companies are still doing POC testing with Kajima. We had another delegation 
of health tech. We had one in October, we had one in April again this year, and we'll be doing food tech at some point. We're not sure if it's this year or early next year, but we have a lot of next generation proteins, plant-based technologies. We're getting a lot of attention from the trading companies in Japan. One of them is actually doing a POC next month in one of the general trading companies, canteens, and across a thousand 7-Elevens in Tokyo as well. So broadly speaking, smart city, health tech, and food tech are the three verticals that are getting the most attention and capital. Uh, please remind me of that 7-Eleven campaign when it comes up. It's a protein powder. Yeah, I can't name the company because I've just said about the POC, so I can't give that away. But it's a plant-based protein powder that's used specifically for training. So not cardio, but if you're weightlifting and you need to bulk up, it's completely organic, completely plant-based, no artificial ingredients, it's gluten-free. You'll start to see more of this company soon. They've existed for two years. I think 80 or 90% of their business is in Japan. They've had some on Instagram promoting their stuff, but that's just one company. We've got a companies who are getting a lot more attention like this. So it sounds mm -hmm. much more interesting than fintech. So it's uh, usually when I go to Japan, I, I do a, a workout with one of our friends at the, the Estonian embassy in Japan. And after an hour's workout next to the Imperial Palace at the Hibiya Park, there's some of this protein powder. We have a smoothie afterwards. It's a nice way to start the morning. Let me ask a very broad question once more because we're nearing the end. You mm -hmm. spoke about the flood of VC capital from mm -hmm. Japan that's going into funds on the one side and then directly mm -hmm. into startups on the other side mm -hmm. versus your traditional area of FDI. I would suspect mm -hmm. that the FDI is somewhat stable. And although, as you explained, it's still a bespoke discussion, not a one size fits all. So you actually need to tailor your offering Venture capital globally over the first six months of the year, there was a bit of a drought. Have you experienced the same or is there a good connection because Japan has been late and we got an increase now in venture capital funding so that the connection with the Nordics may be not as dry as other corridors might have been? FDI, I'm most familiar with talking about Copenhagen and Denmark. My organization, Copenhagen Capacity, we've, we've existed for 28 years. And for the first time in our 28-year history, it wasn't one of the near markets, or the, so the UK, Germany, etc. It was actually Japan. We had foreign companies establishing operations here. Six of them were from Japan. So it was the highest number of foreign direct investment from any country. One of those investments was the largest foreign direct investment in Denmark history. That was Fujifilm creating a European manufacturing center for biotechnology just north of Copenhagen. What we're seeing actually is FDI from Japan has been steady even during COVID. In terms of VC, there's been a boom mostly into tech startups, but sometimes into our local VC funds as a limited partner investments. Last year, the numbers were down globally, but we still had a pretty healthy year. Even during 2020 and 21, the numbers were pretty normal. So there were a lot of investments from Japanese VCs. Also, we have to say CVCs, the corporate venture capital arms, because Japan's VC landscape, it came later to the game than, say, the US or China. Just over half of the funds are actually the VC arms of large general trading companies, like Sumitomo has Presidio, Marubeni has Marubeni Ventures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're working to maintain and help build that incoming tide of VC. And even the numbers this year have been quite good. What I'm seeing with more the financial fintech side, many of the companies have been investors for a long time, five to seven years, and sometimes even longer. But the initial steps were being an P in the fund, as you described, and learning how the game is played. And once they developed enough of an understanding, then create either their own CVC or create mm. a CVC under a major VC mm. firm like Global Brain, mm. which is managing, I think, about 10 or 11 it's, CVC it's, firms. Global Brain is a good example of this. They have a European-based CEO. Who I was actually with in Estonia back in the Latitude 59 Festival. Specifically, Global Brain have been smashing the numbers of any Japanese investor in the last three years. I think they have 32 investments in the last three years. 
There's another interesting example, a VC called Nordic Ninja, which is a 101 million euro VC fund, which was established by JVIC, the Japan Bank of International Corporation, with Panasonic, Honda and Omron as limited partners. That was established in Helsinki. They've just raised their second fund. So you'll see some news about that soon. But that's also an example of seeing the Japanese institutional investors plus corporate investors who are looking at the new Nordics and actually putting money here. And from that fund, it's targeting specifically Nordic and Baltic deep tech technologies. They've made 22 investments since they opened three or four years ago. And six or seven of those are actually unicorns or became unicorns after they were invested into. It's not just talking the talk, but Japanese investors are walking the walk over here. That's very good to see. Gives us hope. Ever increasing Japanese investment flows? Yes. A month ago, we had Amitri and Co. They invested into the world's first e-methanol plant in Western Denmark. That's the one I can announce, but there's a lot of really cool Japanese FDI. In terms of the VC, we're still working on this. We have Nordic and Baltic startups and scale-ups who are in advanced discussions with Japanese investors and also doing POCs. If you are a Nordic or Baltic startup and you are looking to connect specifically with a Japanese investor or partner, go to our platform. It's free, open source, nordicasian.vc. You can get yourself an English and Japanese language profile on the website. There's been a healthy amount of investment into the region and our job is to maintain it and grow it even more. Wonderful closing comment. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you very much, Oliver. <laughs> Thank you, Norbert. Thank you for having me today.